Boom! What's going on, everybody? I am Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skeel, and this is Toy Talk. Today's topic is the history of resin and how resin has been used as a material in manufacturing things throughout the ages. And at the end of this video, I'm going to talk about several of the resin releases that have been made in the recent years, so stay tuned on till the end. Also, if you're returning to my channel, please go on and hit that thumbs up button to like this video. And if you're new here, welcome. Please hit that subscribe button so that you can get notified of all of my future videos. Now, let's get to it. Resin family of plastics has existed for thousands of years. Throughout time, resins have been associated with either natural products or as the manufacture of synthetic products. Resins are a polymers, and which are plastics. Sap. Now there is a natural resin. Often it is seen seeping out of a pine trees as a thick, gooey, amber-colored ooze. And when it's fossilized, the pine sap then becomes a substance known as amber. If you saw the very first Jurassic Park, I'm talking the Jurassic Park back in 1993. That was how they made their dinos. The mosquitoes would land on the bark of a tree, and then this pine sap would encase the mosquito and completely preserve it throughout centuries. And finally, they were able to dig up this amber and pull out the dinosaur's DNA because it was perfectly preserved. It's pretty cool. We see objects that are encased in amber all the time in museums. It's, it's something amazing when they find these things. Now, natural resins, they have been in use since ancient Egypt in making products. The Mongols, they used resin as far back around 1200 AD to make the first composite bow. They made this. This weapon revolutionized military weaponry and it's remained one of the most crucial developments in weaponry all the way up until the firearm was invented. That's how important this was. They made it by binding together the parts with natural pine resin, which made a flexible material and very, very durable, giving that weapon its long range. Very impressive. From the 1870s to the 1930s, scientists were working on developing the first synthetically manufactured resins. However, they didn't have a true knowledge about what polymers were. That didn't come until the later on, but they kept working at it. And then resins, they finally became some of the most important polymers ever discovered. English chemist Alexander Parks, who in 1856 was granted one of the first of several patents on a plastic material that he called Parkesine. Next, the year 1869, it was an important development year for synthetic plastics. A plastic compound was made from cellulose nitrate and camphor tree resin. This was called celluloid. Celluloid changed manufacturing forever. Items that were previously not thought possible to be made were easily made in this new celluloid material. Items such as your combs, hairbrush handles, and toys, just to name a few of the things that became readily easily to make. As a thermoplastic, celluloid is easy to color, it is washable, and it is very durable. It did have one serious drawback, though. Celluloid was flammable. Great material to make toys out of, right? Now, most people probably know what celluloid was used for, and its most famous use was in the early days of the motion picture industry. Celluloid was the basis for the film the motion picture industry used to make their movies. This drawback, though, the fact that it was flammable was the reason why film was stored in a vault. The vault was there to protect the people in case the film exploded. 
it really wasn't there to protect the film from being found or any of the other things. It really was a major safety feature. That's why film is stored in a vault. Today, it's stored in a vault to keep people from stealing it. But back then, it was for protection of the people on the studio lot. And the Eastman Kodak was working quickly on developing a much safer material to make film on, to make motion pictures much safer for everybody. Plastics, they are all polymers. Polymers are broken down into two different groups. The first one being thermoplastics and the second one being thermosets. Now, we've actually talked about thermoplastics in the previous videos back when I was talking about the plastic injection machine and the vacuum forming machine because they use this type of plastic, thermoplastics, in those machines. They use this simply because this particular plastic is durable and it is easily recyclable. It can be recycled over and over again. Thermosets, however, cannot be remelted once they are made and formed into shape. So they cannot be used over and over again. Once a thermoset polymer is formed into the shape we want it to be in, it cannot be reformed into another shape. And it will stay in that shape basically forever until something destroys it. Thermoset polymers, as I said before, do not lend themselves well to recycling. It is possible, but it is incredibly difficult to do. Parkasine, it was one of the first plastics developed. As a thermoplastic, parkasine is readily recyclable. Bakelite, on the other hand, which became incredibly popular in the 1920s, was the first real synthetic plastic that was ever developed. It belongs to the thermoset group of plastics, and once it is formed into a shape, it is not reusable. It will stay in that shape forever. Bakelite was incredibly popular back in the 1920s. Products from your radios all the way up to jewelry were being made out of it because it was inexpensive, easily colored, and one of the biggest developments of the century. And it has led to all of the plastics that we know today trace their roots right back to Bakelite. It was also used in electrical insulators because it did not conduct electricity one great material and there are still some uses of actual bakelite today but most of it has been replaced by other plastics resin is a liquid organic compound that will harden when a catalyst is added to it as in two-part resin processes or it will harden when it is exposed to uv light for uv resins resin is strong and it is very durable comparable to its weight. It is impervious to water, and resin can be colored and painted very easily. The imperviousness to water is why resins throughout centuries have been used to seal boats and seal other things up so that they don't leak or sink. Now we've talked about resins throughout history and why resin has been an incredible development in the making of materials today and products and will continue throughout the foreseeable future to be an important part in manufacturing our everyday products and affecting our daily lives. You probably have tons of resin products around you every day and don't even realize it. But now that we've talked about it, let's go on and show off some of the resin models that have been released in the last 15 years. The development of resin models has exploded the market of model vehicles. It has increased the variety of models that we could ever dream of having simply because it is relatively inexpensive to make tools for, as I've talked about in previous videos. That way we can make smaller runs and have more variety in our collections instead of just having a few die-cast tools. So anyway, let's get to talking about these resin models. Advantage Diecast has taken a twist on resin models. They did this by utilizing 
die cast frames underneath their resin caps. These resin hybrids, they give the best of both worlds because they allow for low production numbers and they also allow for strong structural models that will enhance our collections on our shelves or on our dioramas. We have over here the first releases by Advantage Diecast. Up first is the 1975 Chevrolet C65 medium duty flatbed. Now this model comes in red, white, blue, and yellow versions. They were extremely limited at only 200 pieces a piece. Next they had the 1973 Chevrolet Titan 90 cab over truck. Now this was a very, very popular truck in the 1970s, followed by the 1977 Chevrolet Bison with a sleeping compartment. The Chevrolet Bison is one of the rarest trucks you'll ever find because the Chevrolet Bison was only offered for a very short time and most dealers did not carry them. Also, they released a day cab version of a 1980 Chevrolet Bison. Moving on to farm tractors, Speccast has made many different resin tractors for various organizations over the last 20 years or so. These models have become highly sought after due to their limited nature and very, very collectible to put in your collections. One of the places that Speccast made resin models for was the John Deere Collector Center in Moline, Illinois. Now, the John Deere Collector Center was a great place to study the rich history of John Deere Corporation. And we start off with this first one, which is a 1912 pull motor tractor. It was an experimental design by C.H. Melvin of a plow tractor. It was never completed. It was just a one-off prototype. Next up, we have the 1915 John Deere B2. Again, another experimental tractor. It was designed to test the feasibility of three-wheeled tractors. Also, it was scrapped due to costs. In 1918, John Deere entered the tractor market finally by buying the Waterloo Boy Company tractors and putting out proven tractors right off the bat with their name on them. This became a trademark and a signature of John Deere of just buying proven things and putting their name on them throughout the rest of the company's history. Now next week, I'll talk about Speccast and other resin models that they've made, along with resin models by other manufacturers out there. Let me know in the comments below if you have any of these resin models or if you have any other resin models in your collections. I'd really like to know. And as always, please give this video a big thumbs up Click that subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified of all of my future videos. Oh, and before you go, I've got a totally free report on resin versus diecast. It tells you why we need to stop thinking of diecast only models and start adding resin models to our collections. They really are the future and grab that free copy down in the link in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next Thursday. I'm Logan, the 64th Gear Jammer Skeel, and this is Toy Talk.